Hello everyone. Welcome to the Cesarean Birth Webinar sponsored by ISIS Parenting and presented by Amy Reyes. My name is Chris Just. I'm a certified nurse midwife and the executive director of prenatal education here at ISIS and I'll be your moderator during this presentation. ISIS Parenting is proud to host today's webinar. ISIS is the nation's most trusted prenatal and early parenting destination. We provide innovative programs and a highly edited selection of products for expecting and new families in our four Boston area centers and online at isisparenting.com. And now it is my pleasure to introduce our presenter. Amy Ray, RN, has been a labor and delivery nurse at Brigham and Women's Hospital since 2007. She's a highly regarded childbirth educator at ISIS Parenting where she has taught prepared childbirth and cesarean classes for over five years. She's also the proud mother of three young boys, all delivered by cesarean section for medical reasons. Amy started out as a graduate of the University of Maryland with an undergraduate degree in criminal justice. Prior to going to nursing school, she worked with pregnant teens in Washington, D.C. before moving back to Boston to pursue a nursing degree at Labora College. After graduating from nursing school, she went to Maryland to work in high-risk maternity and labor and delivery at Holy Cross Hospital. In 2007, she returned to Boston and has worked as a labor and delivery nurse at Brigham and Women's Hospital ever since. She has also done part-time work as an overnight baby nurse for newborn nurses in addition to teaching at ISIS. In her spare time, Amy is an avid runner and a strong supporter of breast cancer awareness. Welcome, Amy. Good morning. So I want to start with talking to you all about indications for a planned or scheduled C-section. There are many reasons for this. Some of our scheduled C-sections, the reasons for those are for an unknown breach or a failed version, which means that we tried to rotate the baby manually from the outside, but that didn't work. Um, for twins with the presenting baby is breach, or babies um, or moms that have triplets or more, a complete placenta previa or even a marginal previa, which means that the placenta is actually covering the cervix or a portion of the cervix because the baby has to be delivered before the placenta can be delivered. Medical e issues with the mother and or baby, including hypertension, cardiac disorders, um, gastrointestinal disorders, some sort of orthopedic issues, um, and other multiple medical issues. And then Last but not least, not least is like elective repeat C-sections or women who have had a prior uterine surgery, mostly women who have had myomectomies in the past, which jeopardizes the integrity of the uterine um, tissue. Some of our non-scheduled C-sections, the ones that we see off the floor, off the labor floor, are usually for um, failure to progress or failure to descend or for a non-reassuring fetal heart tracing. And Amy, I just wanted to mention, um, this is Chris, the moderator. Uh, in the previous slide, we discussed how, uh, noted that elective cesareans prior to 39 weeks for non-medical reasons are no longer recommended. And I just want to make note of that, except something that's been in the news uh, lately, and there have been lots of changes made in the hospitals here in Boston that are now following that recommendation. Absolutely. It definitely like to cook those babies as long as we possibly can. So 39 weeks usually gives us that little bit of extra time to make sure that that baby is really cooked to completion, um, as I like to say. Because at 37 weeks, you're just not quite sure gestationally how they're breathing and their temperature regulation and their glucose will do after they come out. So it's better if we can keep them in as long as possible, as long as it's safe for mom and for baby. So prior to your surgery or your birthday, as I like to call it, the baby is go you're going to um, have a scheduled date with your obstetrician and a time for which you're going to come to the hospital for um, your birth date, which is the surgery for the baby, your cesarean section. The day before your surgery, either you'll have to call your hospital or your hospital will call you to confirm with you the time of your surgery, the birthday, and the time you have to come to the hospital and where you should check in at the hospital. I like to talk about this a little bit just because I want you to understand that 
sometimes we tell you a certain time that you're going to come to the hospital and what time we're planning to go back into the operating room to deliver your baby. But depending on what's going on on labor and delivery that day and the flow of surgery that day, sometimes your case might be bumped. So you might not go exactly at the time that we tell you that you were scheduled to go. And that's solely to keep you and your baby safe when we do things. And we just never know what's going to happen in labor and delivery. And so for that reason, if for some reason the time gets changed, it's not because we don't want to take care of you and deliver your baby on the time that we set it. It's just that we want to keep, do it in the safest possible time frame and giving you the most support that we can give you during that procedure. So the day before, you're going to confirm with your hospital. You're going to pack your bags. They're going to tell you where to go in, at the hospital. I always tell people that valet parking is the best option for you, um, especially in the city hospitals. And to keep, only bring in with you at that time when you're coming in for the birthday, for the day of the surgery, to the hospital, all you really need is your camera and your identification. In labor and delivery, you don't need all of your postpartum stuff because you probably won't be going into a regular labor and delivery room. You'll probably be going into a recovery room where you're prepped for your surgery, and then that's where you'll go back and recover prior to going upstairs to postpartum. And it's usually not a completely private area. It's just curtained, bayed off areas. So it's better to leave all the extra stuff in the car until you're upstairs on postpartum or downstairs on postpartum and settled in your room. That way, daddy or your support person is not having to carry around all kinds of stuff and move it from place to place to place to place. Once you get settled upstairs, then you know your support person can go down to the car and bring all the stuff you're going to need for your after for your time in the hospital, which is four days from the time the baby's born, or 96 hours from the time of delivery, not from the time you enter the hospital. Um, it's very, very important to um, follow the anesthesia rules about not eating for a certain period of time prior to your surgery. Again, because this is an elective procedure, even if it's for medical reasons, anesthesia's rule for surgery is that you should not have anything to eat or drink by mouth for eight hours prior to your surgery. That's what's safe for you. It keeps you from having any kind of complications once they give you your anesthesia. A lot of hospitals, a lot of anesthesiologists are using the four-hour rule for clear liquids, but in terms of real food, any type of real food, it's eight hours prior to your surgery, okay? So keep that in mind and just check in with your um, obstetrician to make sure that that's what the rule is at your hospital as well. So what happens if you have labor before you have your scheduled procedure? For most of you, if this is your first time having a baby, you may not even know what labor is supposed to feel like. Um, so here are some reasons why you should be calling your doctor prior to your scheduled date if you think that something's going on that maybe labor has started prior to your scheduled date. Because labor can start really at any time, but after 37 weeks, I say it's fair game and anything can happen from that point on. So if your water breaks, um, and that can be just a slow trickle or it can be a big gush. Some people think it's always going to be like what happens on television. It's not necessarily how that happens. Um, but if you, come, if you happen to put on a, um, a maxi pad and like it just continues to flow out, it's not like you can kegel or try to stop your pee. If it just continues to flow out, it's usually a pretty good indication that your water has broken. If you have regular contractions, so a lot of times people don't know what contractions feel like. Contractions typically feel like you're going to get your period, which you're pregnant, so you shouldn't be getting your period. Um, and they come and go in kind of a regular fashion. They may initially only be kind of like every 10 to 15 minutes. They may only be every half hour. But as they progress and get more regular, um, you'll start to notice them change, get longer. And it definitely it feels like a really, really bad period cramp. Um, or like as if you ate something that didn't agree with you and then it goes away. Um, if you're having any bleeding, your cervix is very, very vascular, so as it changes, it bleeds. So anywhere else in the hospital, we worry about you when you're bleeding, but at, in labor and delivery, when you're in for labor and delivery and it's for because you're in labor, we're actually happy about that. But if you're going to be having a C-section, we don't want you bleeding, okay? Um, if you're having abdominal pain, and for some people that will be contractions, but you're not really noting them as cramping, um, or decreased fetal movement. It, 
at any time during your pregnancy, if you're concerned that you're not feeling your baby move as well, we would rather you call and come in and be checked than to just wait, okay? So it's always a good idea if you have any concerns about any part of your pregnancy that you should be calling your care provider and potentially coming in to visit us at the hospital. It's better to be safe than sorry, and we don't mind checking on your baby. It's what we do. So the morning of your surgery or the morning of your birthday, you're going to come into the hospital, and usually it's about an hour and a half to a two-hour window that you're coming in prior to the time that you've been scheduled. Um, you're going to arrive at the hospital. You're going to check in um, obstetrical admitting, okay, and register. Usually about 28 weeks you do receive a packet from your um, OB care provider or from the hospital for pre-registration because there's a whole bunch of paperwork that you fill out. You should receive that around 28 weeks. If you haven't received that paperwork yet and you're beyond 28 weeks, just check with your OB care provider and make sure that they have put you in to receive that paperwork. And make sure you get that paperwork back to the hospital. It just makes the morning of your um, baby's birthday a lot easier. So you're going to check in and OB admitting. You're going to be brought upstairs to the labor and delivery unit. And you're going to get treated as if you were a labor patient, essentially, because all of us labor and delivery nurses are surgical nurses as well. So we are circulators. We go back into the operating room with you. We care for you from the time that, we're, that we meet you through the recovery period until we get you upstairs to postpartum. So you'll still get that same type of bonding experience that you would get out on the labor floor. It's not like you go into a main OR and there's a bunch of people that don't really know a ton about babies and you have this surgery, but at the end of it you get this beautiful little person. Um, you get labor, labor and delivery nurses too, which I think is very, very nice. So you're going to come upstairs to um, labor and delivery. They're going to um, do your intake. They're going to ask you a bunch of questions about your medical history, what your plans are, who's your pediatrician. Um, any concerns that you have and whatnot. And then they're going to um, start your IV, um, which supports your blood pressure during your procedure and keeps you hydrated. Um, they're going to do your vital signs. They're going to listen to the baby, and they're going to put on the um, tachometry to see if you're contracting. Um, essentially, what we're going to do is what's called a non-stress test. We're, and it's, I call it baby vital signs. It's the best way we know to know how your baby's doing on the inside. So we will watch the baby on the monitor find the baby's um, baseline heart rate and see if the baby's tolerating intrauterine life because we want to know that the baby's happy in there even though we're about to bring the baby out into the real world, okay? Um, at that point, um, somebody from the anesthesia team is going to come and talk with you. They're going to ask you a whole bunch of questions. They're going to ask your family history about anesthesia. They're going to have you sign the consent for anesthesia. And then your obstetrician, and usually it's your primary obstetrician who schedules you on the day that they're at the hospital rounding so that they can do your surgery. But if you come in prior to that, it's whoever's covering your group at the hospital. Okay? They're going to come in. They're going to talk you through the, um, the surgical um, concept, consent um, for a procedure, and they're going to have you sign that consent. And then at that point, when everything is in position and everything's ready, we're going to walk back or roll back into the operating room, okay? Um, once we are in the operating room, anesthesia really becomes who's caring for you at that time, okay? Because they're managing your pain, your IV fluids, antibiotics that they're going to be giving you just prior to the, when we start the um, surgery, um, your vital signs. So they're really going to be the people who are taking care of you in the operating room. Of course, your nurse will be there with you circulating the operating room, um, and then there will be a surgical assistant who's going to help the doctors, and there's going to be another either resident or another attending that will be helping your doctor deliver your baby. Um, from an anesthesia standpoint, there's a couple of different ways that they can decide how or what kind of anesthesia they're going to give you in the operating room. For most standard um, cesarean sections, people get spinals, which is a very short-acting, instantaneous pain relief that kind of moves up to just about underneath your breast in terms of numbness and covers you for about three hours from the time that it's 
administered until the time that you're able to really move your legs and move your bottom and lift your bottom up off the stretcher. Um, and then for some people, they need what's called a combined spinal epidural. Those are more for people who are going to have a complicated cesarean section or have had prior uterine surgery or prior abdominal surgery in the past where it might take longer for them to get to your uterus, deliver the baby, and then close the uterus and all of your layers to finish the surgery, okay? And that will be a decision that's a decision made between your obstetrician and the anesthesia team and discussed with you at the time of delivery. But just know that there are two separate options. There's the spinal anesthesia that works very, very quickly and which is usually our standard. Um, but then for people who have had prior surgeries, an epidural, a combined spinal epidural um, is what they use. And essentially the only difference is, is that once they deliver the dose of um, spinal medicine, they actually thread an epidural catheter into your back and leave it there so that they have access to deliver more medicine if they need to. In the operating room, it's going to be very, very bright and a little bit chilly. Okay, we will try to keep you warm. Typically, the surgery lasts anywhere from about an hour to an hour and a half um, for a standard non-complicated cesarean section. And it takes a lot longer for us to put you back together than it does to take your pad and get to the baby. So just anticipate that it'll be very quick to deliver your little person, but it will take longer for us to put everything back together the way it's supposed to be put back together because we just take our time and do things appropriately. Um, but you'll be distracted by your little person anyway, so it really won't be that important. Um, again, the people that will be in the operating room, because it will seem like there's a lot of people in that operating room. Um, your circulating nurse, who that's the nurse that admitted you onto labor and delivery, delivery unit, started everything, your IV, did your big vital signs and whatnot, and walked with you back to the operating room. There will be a surgical tech who hands off instruments and does counts in the operating room. You are the primary OB and then someone to assist them, either a resident or an, another attending and the anesthesia team. And then at the time of delivery, there'll be a pediatric team there to just assess the baby and support the baby. Um, and once they've done their job making sure that the baby's great and has no issues whatsoever, they'll actually just be leaving the operating room. In terms of anesthesia, just so you know, you will have um, some sort of antibiotic um, as they're placing your spinal or your combined spinal epidural. Usually they use ANSAF, um, but if you have an allergy to penicillin, they will use, some, use something else. And they'll discuss this with you, and they'll be asking you about your um, allergies prior to administering any types of medication at all. Um, once we get your spinal epidural in place, we will be lying you down on the operating room table. And typically, once they started to dose you with your spinal epidural, you're already quite not able to lift up your legs and help us get you onto the operating room table. So we'll be doing that. And at the same time, there'll be a couple people helping. We'll be listening to the baby's heart rate. We'll be um, putting your catheter, your Foley catheter in, which is a tube that we place into your urethra and keep your bladder empty during the procedure and for about 12 to 24 hours after the surgery. And the idea behind that is, is that once we've incised into your uterus, we don't want your bladder filling up and pushing on that incised uterus because it can make you bleed a little bit more and you won't be as mobile as you would like to be to be able to get up and go to the bathroom as frequently as we would like to keep that bladder empty. So that stays in for about 12 to 24 hours depending on your um, obstetrician's post-op orders. Okay. We will be um, prepping your abdomen with an um, alcohol prep called chloroprep. Okay, it's like this orangey like liquid that goes on your belly and we scrub your belly to keep you from getting any post-op infections and it stays on afterwards. We actually don't wash it off and it stays on and it washes off as you shower over the next couple of days. And it, it, it's used as an antiseptic to try to um, prevent any post-op infections. We will also be putting either TED stockings on which help um, keep swelling down and also circulation flow to your legs, or we'll be using something called Venadyne boots, which actually pump up and relax and pump up and relax for the time that you're on the operating room table until the time you're up and moving around, which is usually the next day at some point in the morning time. Okay. Once we start, our, start the procedure, the baby is usually delivered 
anywhere from about one to five minutes from the incision of your skin. It's very, very quick to the baby, okay? So once the baby is um, born, you're going to feel, at the time that the baby is born, you're going to feel a ton of pressure. You shouldn't feel pain, and the anesthesiologists are going to be asking you all the time, what are you feeling? Are you feeling anything? You may feel a little bit of pulling, and you'll be have some sort of awareness that somebody is at your abdomen, but you should not feel any pain at, on your abdomen or at the incisional site, which is very, very low on your abdomen. It's just basically at your pubic hair line or just above it where your underwear kind of meets your um, abdomen. Once the baby is about to be born, though, there will be somebody that's pushing on your um, top of your fundus, which is the top of your uterus, which is up high on your belly, as you know, or will know shortly. <laughs> um, and at that time, you'll probably hear the circulating nurse as well as your obstetrician saying, okay, you're going to feel a ton of pressure right now, but the baby's about to be born, okay? And once that happens, once the baby's born, you should feel nothing anymore at all except for joy that you have a little person, okay? And typically, babies um, will come out screaming and crying, okay? But sometimes they don't, and that's okay too. Sometimes they just need to be reminded that it's time for them to participate. So that's why we usually are stimulating, rubbing their back, maybe bulb suctioning them, and showing you the baby up over the drape because there will be a sterile drape that's in front of your face um, so that you're not breathing down into your abdomen. You should know that everybody in the operating room is going to be draped so that they are not exposing you to anything or exposing the baby to anything. So everybody will have a mask on, everybody will have a cap that covers their hair, and everybody will be in sterile scrubs, including your husband or your support person in the operating room. Um, once the baby is born, the cord will be clamped and cut, and the baby will be handed off to the pediatric team in the operating room. And they will be doing some, just some stimulation, drying the baby off, and scoring the baby's APGARs, okay? And APGARs are a score of newborn well-being, and we look at them at one in five minutes. And what we are looking for is their respirations, their heart rate, their color, their tone, and their irritability. And they can get anywhere from a zero to one, a zero to two, on each one of those categories. Typically, babies get eight and nine or nine and nine. No babies get tens because their hands and their feet are never completely pink, and that's due to their circulation. I don't care who you are, I'm not giving your baby a tent. <laughs> okay, and that's okay. They'll be just fine. Some babies do, with a cesarean section and with a normal vaginal delivery, come out a little stunned. It's a little bit shocking for them. They go from very dark and warm to cold and all kinds of people looking at them. So uh, sometimes they need a little bit more vigorous stimulation. 90% of babies do absolutely fine. About 10% of babies need some sort of resuscitation at delivery, whether it be just some vigorous stimulation and rubbing down or bulb suctioning. And of those 10%, about 1% need further resuscitation, whether it be positive press pressure um, air, whether they need oxygen, whether they need actual like medications to stimulate the process for them. So that's a very, very small percentage. Most babies do absolutely fine, but we just never know, and so we're always prepared for what we need in case we need it. Once the baby is cleared by um, the obstetrical team, um, by the pediatric team, your placenta at that point has probably been delivered, okay? Um, it's a manual removal, and you probably will have no sensation of what's going on there because you're preoccupied by what's going on over in the corner with your little person. Um, your baby will have, be weighed. It'll have its length measured. It'll be wrapped up and swaddled. It'll get its vitamin K, which helps with its blood clotting and with um, bacteria stimulation. And then it will get its hat and diaper, and it'll get its identification. Typically, there's four bracelets. Mom gets one. Your support person or whoever's going to be in the hospital with you the entire time will get the other. It's whoever mom chooses to have that second adult bracelet and the baby usually has two, one on each ankle that match those two other bracelets. Every time they bring the baby or take the baby from you for any reason, they're going to check those bracelets. We try very hard not to separate you guys if we don't have to, but sometimes for some reasons we do have to separate mom and baby, and for those reasons that's why those bracelets go on. We ask that you do not take those bracelets off 
for any reason until you're home in the house with the baby. One of the baby's braces will come up and go in his permanent medical record at the hospital, and the other mom will go home with the baby. And you can take them all off and put them in the baby book at the end. But please do not take those bracelets off. Those are our identifications and our safety for the, you and your baby, okay? The baby will be swaddled up and handed to mom, uh, your support person, and then potentially even skin to skin in the operating room. It's just a matter of how mom is feeling and what's going on in the operating room and what's manageable. Um, if you have special requests, absolutely ask the nurse that's taking care of you. If we can accommodate those things, we will. Okay, we just want to keep you and the baby safe during this process. Once all of the baby stuff is taken care of, it takes about 45 minutes to an hour to close mom and get mom off the operating room table, okay? So what's happening is that they're just slowly, they've delivered the placenta, they're, they're just making sure your bleeding is okay, and they're closing your uterus, they're closing your muscular layer, and then they're, they're closing your skin layer. During that time, you're just going to be bonding with your baby. You might start to get the shakes a little bit. It's not abnormal for people to start to shake from the anesthesia and from the delivery of the baby. It happens for vaginal deliveries and for C-sections. During that time also, there is a chance that you might have some nausea or vomiting um, due to the anesthesia or just from the delivery of the baby, okay? If that stuff happens, anesthesia is man monitoring that and they can give you medications through your IV to help with that. Any medications that we give you during this process are safe for the baby. We wouldn't give them if they weren't safe. Hey, Ma, this is Chris. Just a quick question. Um, I know this comes up sometimes. You had mentioned that there's a drape in front of mom and the support person, and uh, during the, the repair, I know some support people want to stand up because they hear the baby cry uh, and they want to see the baby, right? And I know sometimes that um, coincides with the moment the uterus is taken out of mom and put on mom's chest for the beginning of the repair. And I know some support people have, you know, uh, found that somewhat surprising. <laughs> I, I myself, as a nurse midwife, had to catch a few support people as they, as they began to faint. So. Uh, just a little word of warning to not peek over that drape unless you check with the uh, providers first. <laughs> That's a very good reminder. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, please, you support people, okay? I will leave you on the floor, unfortunately, because there's a lot going on in that operating room. <laughs> so, um, and I also do not take care of big people, just little people. I take care of laboring mothers, but I do not take care of big people. I will send you to the emergency room, okay? So just be clear about that. Give us fair, fair warning. You usually get pretty white very quickly and pale and not looking so well, and we usually can catch that, but sometimes we're busy doing other stuff. So just let us know, but absolutely do not stand up. Do not think that you can actually videotape the surgical procedure because you cannot do that. You can bring a camera into the operating room and take pictures of the baby over at the warmer when your circulating nurse walks you to the warmer and asks you not to touch anything blue in the operating room. So just a, uh, like a point to keep in mind. Anything blue in the operating room is typically sterile. Please don't touch it, okay? Um, and we will walk you to the warmer so that you can see your baby, okay? And actually bring, have, let you, usually we're really good about like leaving the cord a little bit longer. So because you can't actually cut the cord in the sterile field, which is like right over the abdomen, we usually try to keep the cord a little bit longer so that when we're trimming the cord, if your support person or the father of the baby would like to cut that cord, then they can do that. Um, but just please don't stand up and try to watch the procedure. Um, uh, sometimes we get medical people in the room that are having babies and they're like, I can do that. You're just a daddy or a support person this time. You're not working. So just sit down, okay? Because you don't need to see your, the whole person's insides. Nobody does, <laughs> okay? <laughs> Keep that in mind. That's a good thing to remember. Thanks, Chris. Once we're leaving the operating room, you are not going to be able to lift your bottom. You may not be able to wiggle your toes. You may be, not be able to bend your knees. Those are all very normal things. Some people find that a little bit distressing, but just know that that's normal, okay? We're going to move you off of the, we're going to clean up your belly. We're going to clean up your back. If you have that combined spinal epidural catheter in, 
as long as everything in the procedure went well and the surgery went well and went, there's no concerns for excessive bleeding or for the potential to have to go back in to do something else, they'll pull that catheter out, we'll move you onto the um, stretcher and we'll move back to recovery. In recovery, really it's a basic recovery of at least two hours. And those two hours are really an anesthesia-like order. You have to be able to bend your knees, wiggle your toes, and plant your feet on the stretcher and lift your bottom up off the stretcher so that we can give you some really cute mesh under panties um, <laughs> before you can go upstairs to postpartum. When you get upstairs to postpartum, the rule is that you have, so we will pull you off the operating room table, but in order for you to go to postpartum, you actually have to be able to crab crawl off of your stretcher onto your postpartum bed, okay? So that's really how you get your path to go upstairs to um, postpartum. For some people, anesthesia is all about how your body metabolizes it. So for some people, it takes a little bit longer for you to get rid of that anesthesia and be able to do those things. Some, I've had patients that I've had for four hours because they just can't, they can wiggle, they can bend, but when I ask them to lift their bottoms, they just can't plant and lift. And that's okay. We'll keep you until it's safe for you to fall upstairs. At that point, when we get into the, op into the post um, operative recovery room, we're going to be having you bond with your baby, doing skin to skin with your baby. Um, we're going to position you in a way if you're choosing to breastfeed, we're going to start to breastfeed in the, oper in the post um, op recovery room. We're going to be monitoring you, and what I mean by that is that we're going to be checking your blood pressure, your temperature, your oxygen saturation, and your bleeding every 15 minutes for the first hour. And then once we move into the first hour post-recovery into the second hour, it's every half hour until you go upstairs to postpartum. And what we're going to be doing is, is squeezing on your belly and checking your fundus, which is the top of your uterus, to make sure it's clamped down and that it feels like a rock. It should feel like a rock in your abdomen. And we'll actually have you put your hand down on your belly and feel that so that you know what it is we're looking for. If it doesn't feel like that, it typically means that your uterus is a little bit foggy, and that means that you could be bleeding a little bit more than we want you to be bleeding. You will bleed normally, just like a vaginal delivery, pretty heavy for the first 48 hours. Not consistently, but every time you get up, every time you move around, you might feel something come out. And then it'll slow down quite a bit, and it usually is a little bit less bleeding than somebody who's had a vaginal delivery because while they were in there, repairing everything, we had an opportunity to kind of suction out some of the stuff that was in your uterus. In terms of pain management, this is something that's very, very important to discuss because a lot of people have an anticipation that they're going to have zero pain after cesarean section, and that is an unreasonable expectation, okay? You will have some sort of pain during this process, some sort of discomfort but it's manageable discomfort, and we will give you medications to manage that discomfort, but there is no amount of pain medication that we can give you that's going to give you zero pain. So just get that in your head now that there is no, it's an unreasonable expectation to have zero pain after your cesarean section, okay? Even with a vaginal delivery, no matter how much medicine we give you, your vagina is going to be a little bit sore afterwards. The same with your abdomen. It's going to be a little bit sore, and that's normal. Typically, for the first hour into recovery, you have no realization of that we're pressing on your uterus really, really hard on the top of your fundus when we're checking for your bleeding and making sure that it's rock steady. But usually, once we're about an hour out, you do start to have, um, a lot of people describe it kind of like as some burning sensation or along the incision or some aching. And it does get sore and does progressively get a little bit sore and sore, okay? We do give you some pain medication at that point, but the medicine that we've given you in your epidural or your spinal is called Doramorph, which has about an 18-hour lasting management effect. It doesn't have a full management effect like the first three hours that we've given you of that spinal, but it does have a lingering effect that doesn't allow us to give you a narcotic for the first 18 hours from the time that the spinal is delivered. After that point, you will be given a possible either oxycodone or Dilaudid or Demerol, depending on what you're able to tolerate, along with Motrin or Tylenol, ibuprofen, depending on your allergies and what you're able to tolerate as well. But in the first hour to two hours in the recovery room, 
we will offer you um, either Motrin or something called Toradol or Ketorolac. That, that Toradol and Ketorolac are the same medicine. It's just two different names for it because we like to make it confusing for everybody. Um, <laughs> it's a wonderful drug. We give it to you IV, um, and it essentially is just like IV Motrin. It just bypasses your GI system, your gastrointestinal system, which is kind of a good thing because you haven't eaten in eight hours, and it's hard to take Motrin on an empty stomach. Um, so if somebody doesn't offer you that, ask for it because it's wonderful. <laughs> Um, and that will uh, allow you that little bit of time that you need until you've started to eat a little bit of something. And then the next time you need something else for, um, to manage with some of the pain, they can give you Motrin because that, at that time, it'll be about six hours you'll have had something to eat. In terms of eating and drinking, it's kind of what, how you're feeling and what the nurse will tolerate for you, okay? Your diet is usually advanced as tolerated, so how you're feeling is how we kind of give you things. But as somebody who's had three C-sections, this is where some of my personal stuff gets involved. Usually if you've had no nausea and no vomiting, the first time you have nausea and vomiting is when we take you on the elevator to go to your postpartum floor, and it does not feel good to throw up on an abdomen that you've incised on. So. I am very hesitant to give my patients anything but some ice chips, and you're not going to get anything from me for the first hour. After that, we can have a discussion about some ice chips. Um, but I always tell people, as much as you really, really want something in your mouth and in your stomach, like you, and that's the first question, as soon as we're rolling, when can I have something to drink? I'm telling you that you will be grateful to me if you try to limit that until you're upstairs on your recovery, in your recovery room, in your postpartum room, settled, where you're not going to be having to move around and get jostled around for a couple of hours. But I will give you some ice chips, and most nurses will give you some ice chips, but they're not going to be giving you a full, full meal in recovery. And that's just so that you're not getting sick on your abdomen, because it does not feel good to throw up on that abdomen. Even if you've had no nausea and vomiting, the likelihood of you getting a little bit of something when we take you on the elevator is pretty good. Um, like I said, we're going to initiate breastfeeding if that's your plan. If not, if you're into bottle feed, we will offer um, and teach you how to bottle feed your baby. We'll um, help you change diaper for the first time or help your support person um, learn to change a diaper for the first time. In terms of caring for the baby, Typically, C-section babies haven't had that really good squeeze that they get coming down the vaginal con canal. So they tend to be a little bit more mucusy, or I like to say juicy. <laughs> um, and so they tend to have a little bit more mucus and a little bit more like productive bubbles coming out of their mouth when they're um, as newborns. And that usually lasts about 24 hours. Sometimes they need a little bit more bulb suctioning, or they sometimes even need some deep suctioning to get rid of that fluid. The more that they cry, the better. I know that most people are like, shh, shh, I don't want the baby to cry. This is a very good time for your baby to be crying. We like them crying. It's how they get rid of all that fluid, how they open up all those sacs in their lungs and exchange the gas exchange. So the more that they cry, the better. It makes us very, very happy. It also sometimes can impede their initial feeding, only from the factor is that if you think about, and I always tell people, treat the baby like as if they're a little person. When you don't feel good or your tummy doesn't feel good, you don't want to eat. So if they still have that mucus and they're trying to get rid of it and they're trying to eat, it might not feel that good in their belly and so they don't feed great right there and then. It does not mean that they're not going to be great feeders. It just means that they just kind of have to get rid of some of that stuff. It's just like that's when we have like a post-nasal drip and it's dripping into our stomachs and we don't feel that good. The babies are the same way. So it might just take them a little bit of time, but it does not mean that they're not going to be successful, okay? So just don't be frustrated by that. It's normal, and it's expected, and we watch for it. And we're going to teach you how to bulb suction your baby because they are a little bit more mucusy or juicy, and you will be having to do that on occasion with them, okay? So once you've done all of those things and once we've cleared you from an anesthesia standpoint and from a uh, like normal recovery standpoint, we're going to be transferring up to, to postpartum. <coughs> Upstairs in postpartum, you're going to have a private room. We'll teach you the, your, the per, your support person how to help take care of you. Again, we'll advance your diet as tolerated. Again, with the Foley catheter that's keeping your bladder empty, 
that is really your doctor's orders, you know, whether it comes out in 12 hours or whether it comes out in 24 hours. Um, usually it comes out anywhere between 12 and 18 hours, but it really is in terms of how are you feeling, how are you getting up and moving around, are you able to get to the bathroom in an appropriate period of time. Um, and then pain medication um, and assessing your pain. Typically the first 48 hours are very, very sore, um, but managed with either oxycodone or Motrin or a little bit of both. Um, and then at some point you may just need some Motrin or some Tylenol. It's just about what you need. And I always tell people, don't hesitate to take pain medication because your body will just be stressed. It will stress you. You're already stressed because you've now become a parent. It's something new for you. Um, and you're not sleeping. The baby's feeding every two to three hours. Um, your body has just had major surgery, um, and it needs to relax and needs to recover. So don't hesitate to take pain medication. Um, you want everything to be re as relaxed as it possibly can be as you venture into this new role in your life, okay? Um, I encourage you, if you are one, especially if you're one of the early morning C-section cases, to be up out of bed by late afternoon. It's very, very important that the sooner you get moving and getting out of the bed, the better you're going to feel. Um, so if you're like the 7.30 case or the 8.30 case or the 9.30 case, even the 10.30 case, you should be up out of bed by 4 or 5 in the afternoon. And if you're one of the later cases, if you're a 12.30 case or a 1.30 case or even a 2.30 case, sometime in the evening time, whether 8.30, 9.30, you need to be up out of the bed. And if somebody doesn't come to offer you to get out of bed, you should be, you, you know, advocating for yourself to get out of bed with somebody. And that somebody is not your support person. That is a nursing person, okay? But the sooner you get moving, the better you're going to feel. And I promise you, you're going to get up out of the bed, and it's gonna, it may take you 20 minutes to get out of the bed the first time, and that's normal. And you might get up out of bed and only get halfway standing upright, but that's okay. The sooner you start moving, the better you're going to feel. So even when you're lying in your postpartum bed, I want you moving from side to side and shifting around and bringing yourself up in the bed and trying to move and lift your bottom up and down. You could hold your abdomen and hold your dressing, your incision, but if you don't move, you are going to feel a whole, of a, lot, a whole lot worse, okay? M moving around is going to help you immensely in terms of starting to be able to take care of your baby on your own and for you to start to recover. By the second, by your first post-operative day, so not the day of your baby's birthday, but the next day, you should be walking the postpartum floor at least four times that day. Not with the baby in your arms, but you actually walking the postpartum floor. Those TED stockings or those new mobiles are going to come off at that point that day and you really need to be moving around. It's going to help push the fluid back into your circulation so that you're peeing out a lot of the IV fluid that you've gotten. It's going to help with you to start to like pass gas, which is a very big deal, especially after you've had abdominal surgery. And a lot of people will have what I call referred gas pain, which actually, especially with C-sections, that comes up through your shoulders. I've had patients describe it as like they feel like they're having a heart attack because it comes up through their shoulders and down through their chest. The more that you're moving, the less likely you are to have that. They're going to give you something called cimetocone. It's essentially mylocon for adults, which you may need to give your baby mylocon at some point um, when, they're ba when they're newborns. Um, it helps um, to pass gas and whatnot, but the more that you move, the better you're going to feel. Um, other non-medicated ways to deal with your pain, things that I did because I'm not somebody that tolerates um, pain medication that well, and these are, there's no real rhyme or reason to it except for that it made a lot of sense to me, and this is what I did. I iced my incision because I felt like it was something that, like, when you have a, when you have a, when we do orthopedics, we ice people's knees, um, and we ice people's tips and stuff, so I was very logical about things. I was like, okay, well, I'm going to ice my incision because it does get a little puffy, like, the next, the days following your surgery. So the pads that they use actually for vaginal deliveries are actually the perfect size and they only last about being cold for about 20 minutes. So, and they are actually the perfect size to just rest on your um, incision after um, your dressing has come off. Your dressing will come off 
the, not the day of your baby's birthday, but the next morning, and your incision will be open to air, which means that they're not going to put another dressing on your incision. You're probably going to have something called steri strips across your incision, which are just like strips of very sticky looking band-aids um, that will stay on forever if you do not wash them off. So the day that they take off your um, dressing and the, when they let you take your first shower, which is the best medication that you can ever have after a cesarean section, your shower tops all pain medication we can ever give you. Like your support person is going to be like, please come out of the shower. I was in the shower for 45 minutes after my first C-section. It's fabulous. The nice warm water feels so good and it just relaxes all of your muscles in your abdomen. It, re it just relaxes every inch of your body. Um, and you're going to soak and water your incision just like you would the rest of your body. You use the same soap that you use at home, your normal soap, and you take a good look at your incision every single day. It's very, very important that you know what your incision looks like because sometimes you can get a post-operative infection or you can get some bleeding and it's not abnormal to see a little bit of like crusted bleeding at your incision. That's completely normal, but you want to know what your incision looks like so that you can assess how it's progressing and how it's healing as the weeks go on. Typically by about six weeks postpartum, it just looks like a little line on your abdomen. It might be a little bit reddened. Um, some people do develop keloids, and that's something that's genetically linked. We really have no control over whether you will develop a keloid. If you know that you're somebody that develops keloids, you should just anticipate that you're going to get a keloid at your incision. Um, there are some steroids that we can inject into that and you can have a discussion with your doctor um, prior to having a surgery anyways. Um, but So I iced my incision. I also um, used a binder afterwards, but not until I was about two weeks postpartum. And I actually only used my like belly band that I used during my pregnancy. It just gave me a little bit of support and I literally folded it over so that it covered my incision and just gave myself a little bit of extra support underneath my clothing. You will have some swelling that develops between like post-op day two and day four. Um, just as you're going home, you're gonna notice that your feet are very, very puffy and very, very fluid filled. Um, and that's because um, fluid just kind of pushes into your tissues and it just has to recirculate back into your system so that you can pee it out. You're going to notice that um, the first like 24 to 48 hours you may not be, be peeing very much at all or avoiding very much at all and then all of a sudden you're going to dump out like three to four liters, liters of fluid a day and that's normal and that's just your way, your body's way of healing. Um, but you will go home and be very, very puffy like you'll be able to see the veins in your feet. Um, you may not be able to get your sneakers on for a couple weeks and that's normal. Um, it's usually about 12 to, 12 to 14 days from the time that you leave the, from the time of your surgery to when you see the veins back in your feet or your ankles again, and that's okay. <laughs> that's normal. You'll know if it's not normal and it's too much fluid, um, but expect to have some sort of swelling in your lower extremities after surgery. It's just it's normal. It's your body's way of like readapting to the fact that there's now no longer an enormous uterus in your abdomen and everything needs to recirculate uh, properly again and you have some swelling in your abdomen and that's what's preventing everything returning rapidly and you being able to get rid of that fluid correctly. Um, so keep that in mind. So you stay at the hospital, you're going to get, um, they'll have breastfeeding classes, they'll have bath classes. There's always somebody there to support you with your breastfeeding or feeding or any questions. There's always a nurse. Um, and lactation support, and then your stay at the hospital, like I said, is 96 hours from the time of the delivery, okay, not from the time you check in at the hospital. Your pediatrician or somebody who's covering your pediatrician will see your baby every day at the hospital and then give you discharge instructions and when to follow up with your pediatrician if your pediatrician has not seen you at the hospital. Um, your car seat, you need it the day that you're leaving the hospital and um, you'll need to bring it upstairs to postpartum so that the nurses know that you know how to put the baby into the car seat correctly, but they will not go downstairs with you to your car and actually install a car seat into the car. So you need to make sure that you know how to do that properly before leaving the hospital. Thank you very much.
All right, we come to the end of our presentation. A big thank you to Amy Race for sharing this valuable information with us today, and thanks to everyone for attending. We hope to see you at another ISIS online event or an on-site class sometime soon. Bye now. Thank you. Please stand by.